first of all, thank you, Mena, for um, fulfilling like a child's dream because I always watch TV and it was also about the spunt of Bussum and now I'm here talking to you guys, so thank you for that. <laughs> so, but that's not why we're here. Um, we're here to talk about how DevOps is evolving uh, from service to services. Um, you, Mena told it, I by accident coined the term DevOps uh, by organizing a conference in Belgium about five to six years ago. So I followed the whole ideas and you know, the community being formed. Uh, recently, I moved a lot into mobile stuff. I organized mobile delivery days, not to start a new trend. But the idea is whenever I start something, it's somewhere chaos and I try to get new ideas and get people together to talk about these ideas. And that's my learning uh, facility. So after the couple of years, um, I kind of have this mental model of DevOps, or at least how I see it being implemented in a lot of the companies. Now, two groups, the development people, the operational people, and usually the first step is like, get, let's get delivery faster to production. So all the continuous delivery pipelines, all the testing, make that faster to production. The next step is to get all the information from production back to the project. There comes logging, monitoring, metrics. So you kind of get this feedback cycle to get the information back. Then kind of you go a step further. It's not just technical, but you put like more knowledge of the project into operations. So they know the business. It's not just a random number. It's like the dollars, the number of people that are infected uh, when there's an outage. So you put that knowledge back to operations. And then you start seeing business patterns of behavior in your operational world with your real users, and you give that feedback to your uh, project or the business. So you kind of end up with these two feedback cycles. Initially, there's a lot of enthusiasm around the feedback on the technical level, but it, overall, obviously, it's to get the feedback on the business level. You mentioned before, I, I work a lot with broadcasters. This is an example of a Dutch TV show on Saturday morning, so I spent my time watching kids' shows Saturday morning. What's so special about it is that we try to make the same feedback loop, like the kids at home, they can select the next guest uh, who's going to appear on the door, and then they vote for it, and obviously there's some kind of control that the people in the studio can decide whether that's correct or not because you know if one guest has to go to football with his uh, uh, son you know they have to be able to override so it's again a feedback cycle that's quite not new but quite unusual for broadcasters which are used to like push and broadcast their knowledge and now they're getting into the loop of getting the feedback from the audience so that's where I spent my time with. So we're a small company, and we try to focus on the business. So I can do a lot of stuff with IT. I can build everything myself. But we've, we thought it was better to focus on our business. And that's why we use a lot of services. You know, the typical Gmail, Slack, but also community services, uh, libraries on the front end, not on the back end. And the nice thing is we almost have no servers. Um, it really exploded when we started doing mobile stuff, even more services, uh, not something you can install on-premise, but you know everything became a service. It's probably like an ongoing thing in the industry that you know these things are being uh, uh, provided as a service. So like I said, almost no servers. We only have a few of them, and then we scale up and we do our services if there's a peak of a live show or whatever we have to do. So after a couple of years using that model, um, it's been really nice to see how it works. And it's a bit of a rabbit hole. I don't know if that's visible very well, but you, know, you use one service for your developers, and when that's down, they're just going to drink coffee. Uh, it's really annoying, but that's the reality in a lot of these uh, companies. Or um, some service you rely on, they make an undocumented change to their environment, and you're hit by you know, a failure in the build, your pipeline is broken, and things that happen. Or even worse, you know, on Amazon, DynamoDB starts giving like, inconsistent behavior. Once it works, on other 
uh, machines, it doesn't work. So really hard to trust that service. But we do. We always want to go on the cloud and use the service. And even when we scale up for a big show, we have to call Amazon and say, hey, please provide enough capacity because auto scaling for us is too slow. So there's a human step that we have to do when we use a service. So the nice thing about using a lot of services is there's a lot less maintenance of things we have to do ourselves. And we can go faster and speed with speed and focus on our business, which is kind of provide the feedback of the TV shows and build that application. But the problem is the increased risk. We are becoming dependent on external services. So recently, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, the concept of functions as a service. For those who know, it's kind of like the evolution of microservices. The only thing you now deploy is not somewhere in a Docker container and so on. It's just one function with one functionality. You know, Amazon has one, uh, Microsoft, IBM, Google, they're all starting into that space. And it's just to have like a very simple thing. The only business layer you have to deploy, you don't have to worry about the scaling, you don't have to worry about all the rest, you just deploy your functions. You might have seen that with the passion, the show that we use. We use that technology to create all these kind of testimonials on the fly at high peak uh, for the audience. Or for this, this is for a kid's show where we actually create like on real time uh, a lot of the animated GIFs. Uh, it's actually went pushed live a half an hour ago, so <laughs> I was very nervous for this presentation. Um, but the idea is that uh, it's called serverless. Obviously, it's not with our servers, but you think less in servers and you think more in services. So although the point uh, here in the poll was the function is a very simple thing to think about, so it's, it's like very concise, I can get that. One of the other things is that you don't have to worry about the servers. So it tied very well into our journey of using a lot of services, the concept of serverless, uh, making it for us very easy to scale you know, for the one minute interaction during the show to a couple of 30,000 users. That was peanuts for us, and otherwise we have to create like a whole lot of infrastructure just to be able to cope with that one minute. Serverless made that really easy for us. So to understand that a little bit better, um, I went to Promise Theory, kind of invented by uh, Mark Burgess. And theory goes as follows, like you are an agent in an ecosystem. If you, uh, the previous speaker all sa already said it, you're like, the ecosystem you work in is really important. And you make a promise, not like Nell said, not a contract, a bit gentler, uh, a promise. And the promise you make, somebody should be able to verify that. So if a service provides me a service, I should be able to check whether the, that service is working. But it's no guarantee outcome. There is the best I can do, and I don't have it as an intention to fail, but I have to assume that failure can happen. And of course, there's conditions, you know, uh, sometimes it might fail or not based on the conditions, but it needs to be clearly documented when I make the promise. So, so somebody relying on my service actually knows when my service, when my promise uh, is held and when it will be broken. And it will be mutually agreed, so there's no obligation. I can go to another party if I don't agree with the terms, and I can just choose another service. Um, I find it more and more, uh, even we went from continuous integration to continuous delivery, I find myself more and more continuous re-architecturing my environment by just using another service provider, which I agree more under this obligation. And of course, you will depend on a lot of services, like, you do, like we do, and they make promises to you. So you make promises to your customers, they make promises to you. And of course, their promises need to be verifiable, clearly documented, and mutually agreed upon the same thing. But the important thing is, you cannot make the promise on behalf of somebody else. 
I think this weekend, Amazon went down in the Sydney region. There's a lot of havoc. You know, everybody was running, even if you had it like in multiple regions and so on. But ultimately, it's your responsibility. So you cannot finger point as we used to do in the past, even with the contract. You have to assume that failure will happen. And it's your job to make sure that failure, or at least you keep the promise. And it can be conflicting, but not as such that a conflict from somebody else. The conflict is internal. So if you provide your service to somebody who has 1,000 users, somebody with 10,000 users, and you have like, hmm, you're not sure if you have enough capacity when they both have the same capacity, need the same capacity, you might have a conflict in your promise. So you have to be aware of that. And the promise, because you're ultimately irresponsible, can't be pushed, but it needs to be pulled. So I can select a service provider or another one or fail over or have another way of doing that, which is an important a crucial part if you start looking at the services problem. And what you want to do is to create the single point of failure, like we used to do with, uh, you know, with hardware. We do a rate five of disks, but we, we have to start doing like a mirror or rate five of services just to be sure that when we start using those services, we're still we're eliminating the single point of failure. And remember, we're doing all this to go faster, to focus on our business, to maybe to as some would say, to innovate faster and worry less about the stuff. And because, you know, we might not be the best at the other stuff. And the other group might be better. So let's have a trust on them in the system. But we know they can fail and we have to re-architect for failure so it, it, we can keep our promise. So what we do is we abstract the problem away as you know, it's really nice to get a bit further away of the mud. But the problem then is there's too much, many layers of interaction. You don't know anymore what is happening under the hood if it fails. If everything goes well, that's no problem. But if your car breaks down, you know, there's too much electronics. You can't handle it anymore. So there's a lot of abstraction going on there. Some might say, you know, microservices and function as a service is really nice for the developer to have like a single line of code, but to handle the multitude of containers or uh, scaling of all these services is bringing the burden back on the operational point of view. So in essence, the promise is a relationship. You can call that like external services or you know, uh, outsourcing uh, with a good connotation. Um, and because we're grouping that, let's say we, we start using Amazon for our um, function as a service. We're using Firebase for a database. We're just abstracting that away. You know, one super agent starts doing that. But there's a few dangers be, uh, beside just the single point of failure to do that. Uh, so when you have one super agent, you now have a single node again in your uh, promises or your dependencies. So now you have to find an, another one if, if the one fails to fail over. It could be in different ways. You can maybe do it on-premises, the same thing. You can have, choose another service. There's a lots of ways to re-architect that around. But as soon as you start depending on one service, you're creating a new single point of failure in your environment. No matter how good they are, no matter their, their uptime, it's still a single point of failure. And the nice thing is, one, uh, once these super agents start evolving, you, they might have different versions of the world. So version one, version two, and then have to keep it working with the old, because you have to move as well in your ecosystem to the new versions if you want to get the new things uh, of the super agent. So you're in this dance together, and you cannot just say, well, you know, the, the world has to adapt itself to us using as a service, which you could probably do if you're in your own data center, running your own service, you have all the control that you want. And the larger the super agent becomes, within the super agent, things slow down because they are doing things at scale. For example, it took us a long time to get Amazon to deploy a new version because you know they have to test it and, and 
um, wait till they get the org all clear in their whole ecosystem. For example, Spotify decided to use Google Compute Engine because they said, well, Google Compute Engine hasn't evolved as much as Amazon, and we still had a good partner with them to talk about what we actually need. It wasn't a set in stone providing service, they actually had somebody who could talk with them. And sometimes, um, was mentioned before as well, like if you scale things up, it's hard to keep the promise. So um, it's hard to read. But uh, once we started using one of the services, we found out that there's behavior we didn't know from the documentation. Like containers at scale at, on Amazon got reused, and our temporary files you know, got totally overridden, and we didn't know that ahead of time. It was nowhere documented. This is the... Uh, so I always find it really hard to see that, you know, we went into DevOps as a collaboration aspect between Dev and Ops and work together. And in the end, everything got abstracted. So some would say within the serverless movement, we went from DevOps to no ops. We don't need any operators. Somebody else is actually doing it for us. I think that's a bit of a dream. Uh, and reality is a bit different. So what I will show you is a few um, other practices that I see emerging as you wouldn't see, wouldn't immediately recognize as DevOps because they're not internally a, a company, but they're actually facing outwards. So just having a simple status page of your service, uh, that's one of the first things Amazon learned f when they went down for the first time is that it was as much important to communicate to their whole uh, ecosystem than to solve the thing technically. So everybody was flooding their helplines, just asking, like, what's the state? What's the state? And just by having a simple status space, uh, page, uh, people could see what was happening. Um, not a lot of providers do that, but um, this one actually provides a way to see your own uh, usage statistics from within the app. So if somebody provides you a service, that you can actually see the metering inside their product. Or even like this uh, image um, solution does, they actually show the errors and the failures within their own service. So you can see, you know, oh shit, there's a failure that happened. I, I get visibility. They're not trying to hide that away from me. Uh, I'm okay with that because, you know, I, they're just making a promise, but based on this, I can actually um, s um, adapt and architect my solution better. Another simple thing is that when there's a status page, I want to be kept up to date when things are changing or failing. Like, it's no fun to only see it after the fact. So why are they not like proactively telling me like this is uh, failing, we're doing this. It's kind of this constant communication uh, that Travis CI uh, does, for example, pretty well. <laughs> or I want to correlate everything that's happened within my service provider with my own stuff. Like a lot of the service providers, they don't allow you to expose your logs or uh, expose all the events of the service you're using to correlate that with your own environment. Uh, Fastly is a good example. They just allow you to everything they do, put it back where you want it, uh, not just because of the function, but the fact that you can troubleshoot faster, you get the metrics and all the feedback. Um, just this, something as simple as what are the error codes that can occur? Having that documented helps tremendously. Um, we had an identity provider that just went straight to the user as an error saying MongoDB shard error failure. You know, if we had known there was an error that they would send, we probably would have done something about that. Um, a lot of people say, well, you know, uh, I use Google and then I ask them, do you have a backup? Like getting data out of your provider is often very hard, but it should be much easier if, if you provide a service. 
Uh, spanning is one of the solutions to back up your Gmail because, you know, uh, if you lose your email, you know, think of what might happen if, uh, if you do that. Or, you know, Slack is a nice uh, uh, example of even on social media, uh, not just the status page and by email, but they're actually interacting in real time with their audience where everybody can see that and get the exposure of when things fail. So they have like a uh, great community service by having somebody who will actually be very clear, be very truthful to what is happening and what they are doing about it. The practice of post-mortems is used often internally to see what failed, but a lot of companies start exposing their internals, what went uh, bad, to the outside. Why? Again, I can see how I have to keep my, how I can keep my promise and why they couldn't keep their promise so I can start seeing the limits. We use Datadog and the first uh, week we hit them with so many metrics that they started complaining like, hey, uh, you're not using your system correctly. Uh, we thought we were using it the right way, but you know, that's something you learn by collaborating with them. Um, Amazon, for example, nice way of them telling you that a server might fail. It's even more proactive. Please replace this because we've detected uh, degraded hardware, start using a new one. So imagine being proactive to your customers that some things are probably not the right way and you start communicating that to, uh, to your uh, people in your ecosystem. And the change log, uh, you know, it's one thing to say you start, should now start using API version one and then version two, version three, but actually document on what has changed, what will be the impact, and what will be the upcoming impact. Um, there's people uh, in some companies, the only thing they do is read change log from all the external parties, whether it's a package, whether it's a service, to just see what's coming up. Uh, if you don't start, like, making that pretty clear, uh, people start, will start selecting another service because, you know, if you're not open about what will happen, how can they start keeping their promises? Writing a blog, simple way of com communicating uh, to other people in uh, your ecosystem. Uh, speaking at conferences such as this is, is just providing information outside your company uh, and explaining what you do, how you do it, so somebody else can start seeing an insight. Um, making it very easy for people to test things. Um, they all seem so trivial as such, but I don't see too many companies adopting these uh, um, practices. And I think when we start living in an ecosystem of services, uh, we should start doing that like all together and expose that information. Uh, whenever I start using a new service, the first thing I do is I write like a very large thing of whatever I came across as a first experience as a user. I just send that to them as feedback. They love that. They usually say, well, now we can actually get it uh, addressed because somebody else external to the company asked for it. So it's a nice way of interacting with your services. Um, giving them extras because they ask questions, giving them an incentive, uh, extra bonus, extra features, use them as beta testers. Uh, nice way to you know, engage them in your ecosystem. Open sourcing things. Um, you know, it's one thing to show an open source. It's also used for recruitment, uh, for getting the people you want to have the same mindset who want to build the same service. Um, there's even engineer, uh, uh, sorry, there's even companies when you can directly chat with the engineers instead of going through the support system. That's very helpful for direct information, direct feedback without going through any of the hierarchies. And even better, like why not expose your backlog of the things that are coming up and have the people using your service partly uh, co-design or co-prioritize what they want as a next thing in their service, in your service. So for me, a lot of the discussions for now have been focused on DevOps within the company or internally to remove the silos 
and to make sure that those uh, are um, very uh, functional uh, and with less friction and get the most feedback. But I think we should start expanding that same mentality to any of the third parties uh, or services that we start to use. And you make the clear promises to your other agents and you make them verified. So those two things, together with the word promise, that it's not a contract or a fixed thing, uh, will get us pretty far, far in, mo our, in my opinion. And you want to keep the promise of the business. That's basically what we are trying to do. Um, so even days can fail, and it's important to get back up much faster, and obviously with the intention to stay up, but the fact that they, you can react very fast um, is pretty important. So for me, the way I phrase it is external services are the next silo, at least in my world. Um, I think there's evidence with serverless that people are starting to do that. You might say this is a new form of outsourcing or SOA, but I think we need to reframe that with the collaboration and openness that we started to achieve uh, with DevOps internally into our company. So a bit of reading, if you want to look more on promise theory, um, books, there's a nice presentation there. Uh, and then if you want to read a few books around designing delivery, for everybody who's in, into IT delivery, it's a very interesting book, Beyond Blame for the Postmortems, and even a book in Dutch uh, on, um, I think it's Paul Verhagen on authority, um, makes a good read uh, to do that. So that's me. <laughs>